asking to facilitate further discussion. But one of the things I wanted to start with was uh, really an observation and, a, and a, I guess a question about the comment you made, Gail, that uh, also picks up on Angeline's comment about the uh, impact and potential damage of not knowing your community, not, not understanding their values and needs and uh, the way in which that could contribute to or even increase the level of distress that people experience and maybe impact on the trust that they feel. So I wonder what your thoughts are about how we um, might address that, that uh, issue of trust in our services um, through some of the work that you've been doing. Angelina or Gail's on the yeah, road. Yeah, I think, I think Gail might have just dropped off. She'll probably join again. Um, maybe well, her, pi her picture's there. there. Oh, we yeah, should have but I, Yeah, yeah, but I, I can start. So absolutely, you know, these things take time and they take effort and they take commitment. You know, in our... Uh, the work that I've been engaged in and certainly the work that we've done here uh, in Alberta and a lot of the work that I've partnered um, with Leah and others who are speaking, it, it takes experience and time and effort and money and passion. Passion is an absolute necessity if you don't have passion for doing this work, communities can read you like a book. If you're not honest and open, and uh, I mean, authentic has become a buzzword, but it's a word, it's a word that our elders and knowledge holders have been speaking and using in their own languages for a long time. If you're not authentic in the work that you want to do, and the benefits that you're hoping to bring and the passion that you have for improving the health of Indigenous people, they'll know right away. And it's that passion and that commitment to those relationships and that trust that keeps them engaged and committed. An important example of that is if you're invited uh, to different cultural events or you're in community, First of all, do what you say you're going to do. Live up to what you have said. If you said, I'll be back, I'm bringing back these results, make sure you do that because they've got long memories, right? Mm -hmm. And they're expecting you to live up to your commitments. Thanks. Thanks, Angeline. Uh, I wonder, Gail, do you have any comments? Uh, yeah, thanks, Brian. And. Um, I really didn't hear your question because I'm traveling up the mountains to go to one of our indigenous communities to do some research. But I think from Angeline's response, I think I get the sense. Firstly, thanks for the opportunity today um, to present some of our work. And, uh, you know, the program of work that I presented today has been built up over about 15 years. It just hasn't happened overnight. So it's, mm. been, it, it's been a long journey um, traveling that journey with me and our team uh, are a number of really key partners. And I think you have to engage with key partners um, along the journey, not just at the end or at the beginning to get the grant. You have to travel with them all the way along. And that means Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are central to those discussions and partnerships. Uh, in our work, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cancer survivors and consumers, we have a, a, an established group that we've engaged with over many, many years, and we continue to engage and help inform the research and the priorities that we do. Thanks, Gail. You're just dropping out um, a little bit, but... Sorry, I'm dropping out, so I don't know if you no. can hear me here. Yep. Yeah, that's that's better. Thanks. Yes, yeah, so you're outlining really what's been a long-term program of work, and a message from both yourself and Angeline is calling for a very different way in which researchers work. Um, you know, I, 
unfortunately, the as you were saying, Angeline, the approach has often been what researchers feel is important and then going along and asking those questions rather than knowing your community and what, what do they need, what do they want, and the ownership of, uh, of that work uh, and, and the outcomes that, that uh, can follow. So uh, going to listen to what's needed rather than what the researcher thinks is needed seems to be a very important message here. Um, the other issue, I guess, is you present a very clear challenge for our services that they uh, take this approach of uh, seeking to know, to understand and to reach people who, yeah. uh, who have great difficulties in accessing services. So how do we, suggestions about, Gail, you talked about, about uh, the benefits for some clinicians in using some of these tools. Um, you have thoughts about how we can really embed that in our in our cancer services so that they become uh, more appropriate and trustworthy. Lost Gail, maybe Angeline. Yeah, so I know here in Alberta, in cancer care, we do have a screening for distress tool. Barry Bolts was really involved in the development of that form. Um, again, I think we have a place to start, at least here in Alberta Health Services Cancer Care, uh, where we can look at some of what Gail has talked about. I mean, there's outcomes now from a systematic review there's outcomes from research that her and people in other countries with larger Indigenous populations like the U.S. and New Zealand that look at these kinds of distress tools, indicators, and measures. And in fact, um, both Leah, Bill, and myself, through our work with the Canadian Indigenous Nurses Association, are developing, uh, looking at, uh, we're developing an Indigenous data framework for cancer and so, and knowledge translation. So a lot of our work will actually go to support um, looking at what measures, again, that are of value to Indigenous people and that there's a demonstrated need um, for, to address those issues. The other important thing is the work of our Indigenous cancer patient navigators within the system. And uh, of course, many regions across Canada utilize Indigenous cancer patient navigators and coordinators. These are people with varying um, lived experiences and knowledge of their culture and the people that they're working with. Working with them and learning from them is another key way to ensure that psychosocial care is provided in a culturally safe and meaningful way that can help to meet the needs of Indigenous cancer patients. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Angeline. I think we've lost Gail again. Um, uh, and I'm just looking through some of the questions. Um, Kate White posed a question about how do we integrate these resources and awareness into our cancer services, which I think relates to what we've just been uh, talking about. And clearly uh, uh, in Canada, you've been leading the way with distress screening through the work of Barry Boltz and colleagues and Linda and, and your really important foundation work for the discipline of psycho-oncology globally around screening for distress. The message we're hearing is very clearly that language is very important and what, what what the source of distress might be or how that's experienced. And um, I guess this is a challenge for us in many areas of healthcare, but to look at building up measures that come from the experience of the people we're wanting to assist rather than looking at um, how we might apply a measure from one community to another to, to think about what's, what, what, what are the needs, what's the language, how are things experienced and expressed so that we can build that uh, understanding. Um, you've, Gail's not on the line, but your question, Linda, about adapting the measures of distress and unmet needs to a Canadian context. Um, uh, Gail's not there, but um, Angeline, do you have any comment about that? 
just to add that I think it's important to recognize, you know, uh, the indigenous research community isn't very big and that it even means globally. So we work very closely together, many indigenous scholars, researchers, um, and partners on a number of different advisories, research projects, publications, and so forth. And so we, we talk actually quite often um, on these different advisories and in different groups, right? And so we're able to build on and learn from the work of each other that is most often shared quite freely amongst us. So that's one place, good, good advantage, I think, and benefit, something that we can benefit from in working to apply and, or learn how to apply and create resources that will support uh, Indigenous cancer patients. The other side of that is, is I'm happy to say that the majority of regions, cancer agencies, and care providers working uh, in oncology have a genuine interest to help serve and work with Indigenous cancer patients, families, and communities in more culturally appropriate and safe ways. And without that, we wouldn't be going anywhere with any yeah. of this. So that is really key um, to know and understand. We've been lobbying for a long time, and there, you know, there's multiple jurisdictions that some need to step up a little bit, right? in certain regions and places uh, globally. And as you can see from the support that Australia has been given, ministerial governmental support and research support, you can see the uh, breadth and depth of the rich program uh, and the outcomes that they've been able to create uh, within Australia. That is something that I think we're all very hopeful that we can also create here in Canada and within other countries that have large Indigenous populations. Thank you. Thank you, Angeline. And that is a very powerful message about the global community of Indigenous uh, communities and expertise that can be drawn upon, but also that the work is not to be done just by those people alone, but everybody has to con contribute. and. Uh, to that. One of the things that has certainly been a priority here in Australia has been building up the number and, and breadth and availability of Indigenous clinicians, um, uh, health workers and Indigenous researchers so that it, uh, it's Indigenous-led research rather than research that uh, is brought to Indigenous communities. Um, uh, sorry to, to, to put this to you again, Angeline, but Gail's not here. Uh, but I wonder whether you'd mind commenting on that. What progress, what barriers to, to having more Indigenous health professionals and researchers? Well, you know, part of the challenge absolutely is structural and institutional racism. You know, we can have partnerships with uh, Indigenous communities, researchers and organizations and um, academics, Western academics, community, researchers, there's always a strong learning curve. Uh, the idea that, I mean, the idea of blame, ideas of uh, deserving things, the ideas of what actually is sound uh, science, those kinds of ideas are not shared equally uh, across knowledge systems. One thing that I can say to that is I'm a strong believer that uh, Indigenous research and Indigenous research methodologies is in fact a meta paradigm. We're not a paradigm. We actually are a paradigm that has its own knowledge systems, its own languages, its own societies, governments, etc. There's no other methodology or discipline out there that can say that. Um, so it stands, it, to, it makes sense that you cannot then take a paradigm 
or a certain way and approach of doing research and fit it on top of a meta paradigm and expect success. It's actually the other way around. And the advantage and the benefit of that to all vulnerable and underserved populations is that we can learn from our work with Indigenous people to benefit those populations as well with the principles and the foundations that we build in the work that we do with Indigenous people. In my experience, and I think the experience of many who work with uh, within the healthcare system, my background is nursing, when you open the door uh, to be more culturally safe and aware of Indigenous people, it goes across the board with all ethnicities and vulnerable groups. So those are great benefits that we can have in putting in the energy, the time, the capacities and the dollars to do this kind of work. Thanks. I'm sorry you guys are just listening to me. I'm sure you have your own experiences, Barry, that you could speak to as well. Thank you, Angeline. We're gaining enormously from what, you've, what you're saying. So uh, I'm so, sorry that you might feel you're out. You're, in the focus, but it's, it's very, very valuable. Thank you. Right. Thank no, you. I just feel yeah. sorry that we don't get to hear Gail. <laughs> but uh, yeah, thanks. Oh <laughs> uh, no, no, it's very good. Thank you, Brian. Can I jump in here and just follow yes, up, please? <clears throat> so I think what I what Angeline has so clearly stated is that you can you cannot transpose one culture into another and expect the same results. And I'm often <clears throat> I've often heard this expression about that cultural culture will eat strategy for breakfast. And I think we've all heard that. And I think it's a, what I've heard consistently from Gail and from Angeline is that we need to understand the cultural sensitivities and learn how to work together in a much more collaborative partnership way. And one of the words that I often hear uh, talked about from, uh, my in indigenous colleagues is this whole notion of respect mm. that you, you cannot transpose uh, in your culture into somebody else's culture. And I think, Angelique, you're, you're affirming my comment on that. And <clears throat> that is a, a keepsake word that is often used by researchers and clinicians, particularly with uh, with uh, indigenous uh, communities, but really for all communities. And it's that sensitivity that's so important. Uh, Angeline, I'm, I'll follow up with Brian or Brian, you could take over here, but that's really <laughs> my comment on that. Thank you, Barry. Angeline, do you have a response or something you want to say? Well, to that? you know, again, respect is not a buzzword amongst Indigenous people. It's something, it's like our ethics. We carry our ethics with us wherever we go. Um, you know, being respectful, you know, it's Indigenous languages, uh, of which I'm certainly not fluent in, um, that really can provide much better understanding of what that means to be respectful. I mean, I think at the outset for care providers and researchers, Indigenous people, no matter who they are, don't expect you to know and understand their culture, their practices, and their ways of doing things and their beliefs any more than you expect them to know yours. Uh, it's about learning how to ask in appropriate ways um, and being respectful in doing so. And the ways that you do that is by bridging relationships, by being present, by engaging with Indigenous people. If you're invited to a ceremony or a powwow, if at all possible, being there, you know, listening. There's a teaching, we're given two ears, one to listen, one to hear. I mean, that's a good teaching for all care providers and all, just all human beings, period, right? And so when we talk about being respectful, we really need to be self-aware. And I learned this lesson too, don't get me wrong. I learned it a lot over and over. 
You need to be very self-aware of the question you're asking, how you're asking the question, and just overall who it is that you're speaking to and what you need to know to be respectful. But do ask questions, right? And wait your turn. I remember when I first started doing my doctoral, my doctoral research, my supervisor said to me, well, what are you going to do about these focus group people interrupting each other? I said, I'm not going to have that issue. Indigenous people know their circle ceremonies and discussions, and they don't interrupt each other. So those are all important lessons, and you cannot learn those, you know, without being around Indigenous people. Thanks. That's a very, very powerful message, Angeline, and I think uh, uh, Linda's comment picks up on that, that... Uh, uh, many non-Indigenous people are afraid of saying the wrong thing or a friend offending in some way. Uh, so your message that uh, we're not expected to, to know everything about culture and being asking and trying to understand um, is, is, is seems to be the message that you're conveying, that that's the important way to approach this. Yeah, absolutely. So we're kind of at a place where the pendulum is, you're right, it's swung the other way, people are afraid. Some people are afraid to say anything, uh, you know, but the pendulum was over here for much longer. So which I guess it's your turn, <laughs> but you know, it's just, it's just really about being self-aware. Right. And again, you carry your ethics with you and uh, you know, not being afraid to say that you don't understand or you're not quite sure what to do, you know, uh, building relationships, with individuals we kind of come from this place in healthcare and research where we have to be able to have this program this role this idea in place regardless of who is there in that role well if we're going to say that success in working with indigenous people is totally reliant very reliant on relationships then how can we say it isn't going to matter if we remove those relationships, right? So you have to be thinking forward as well. If that happens, which it often does in research uh, and, and just with, you know, healthcare providers, then you have to be working in ways that you're transferring understanding and knowledge, um, you know, forward that idea of corporate memory and those kinds of things, but from Indigenous perspectives. And those are uh, areas of sustainability that we're, we, we're not very good at yet, you know, I think overall. And so those are areas uh, in, in need of much improvement from my perspective. Thanks. Thank you. It reminds me of the um, very simple comment of uh, encouraging our clinicians and, and our students as well, just to ask the patient or think what matters most to this person uh, rather than what I think might matter most to them. And uh, that's, that's the uh, sort of critical mindset to, to understand and know the community, as you said, but also the person that uh, is sitting in front of you. The other thing well, it reminds me of, oh, sorry, Angeline. No, I was just gonna say, you know, it, there's so, there's such a difference between uh, book knowledge and on the ground experience. I was just involved in some work with a Dr. Dunning from the University of Alberta and she's a nook. And something I didn't know about uh, where she's from in Nunavut, you know, I know that there's overcrowded housing, but she talked about two bedroom homes with as many as 22 people living in them. And one of the things that I didn't think about was people have to sleep in shifts. If you can imagine having to take your turn to sleep. Mm. So these are things that most of us who are academics, healthcare professionals, you know, unless we've had those experiences and been exposed to such extreme poverty and those, you know, kinds of issues, 
it doesn't matter if we read it. We just don't get it. So considering the people that you're working with and where they're coming from, I'm, they're not just going to tell you these things because you just mm. met them. So it's about establishing that trust again in that relationship so that and being open about yourself and your own experiences so that they could actually come to a place, especially in psychosocial care, where they could share such intimate knowledge with you that can impact their care and how they're going to get well. Thanks. Well, that's a very powerful message, Angeline, and it uh, brings to mind the whole uh, issue for us in cancer care to remember that there may be a, a range of other really critical experiences and stresses and worries and concerns that people have um, that uh, are pressing on them that we need to be aware of and assisting with. And it also reminds us that sometimes our interventions are um, developed in one setting and, and in, intended to address distress or concerns may not be applicable and that we need to rethink uh, how we develop and design those sorts of interventions so that we identify the concerns that someone has. How do we help them? Um, and, Here, Jack, uh, and for a sec. Oh, sorry, Ryan. Yes, yes, certainly, Linda. Well, I just was reflecting on just what Angeline said about how they're not going to just tell you about your life because they've just met you and, you know, how the whole therapeutic model of building trust and rapport, but our model is always kind of more the therapist, you know, it is the blank slate or doesn't reveal a lot of personal details about themselves. You know, they don't talk about their life and their struggle and their family. And, you know, so I'm thinking how, well, that could really be a barrier, right? Because why would someone from that kind of background, you know, share all this stuff about themselves when, when they're getting nothing from the other person, it would just seem kind of artificial or something. So I wonder like what your reflections are on that about how that means as, you know, as a psychosocial, as a psychologist or a social worker, like how do we need to be different in our roles in that respect when we're working with Indigenous people? Well, you know, one of the things that I've experienced in the work that I've done here in Alberta, but also nationally and internationally is particularly with roles where there is this idea of intimate, knowledge sharing and understanding is we we often come across uh, non-Indigenous care providers who are almost embarrassed in the way that they have to provide their care, right? Um, and we've actually had people who've got up and left the room and just don't want to talk about it, right, who are health professionals. Because it's, it, it, they recognize that there's a lot of issues that are not being addressed, right? And much of this comes down to cultural safety. And cultural safety isn't just about, oh, that resource is in the right language and it's got lots of pictures. It's about the environment and the safe space that you create to work with that person, right? Some of that we only have so much control over, like, does the room smell like a hospital? You know, you <laughs> might not have any control over that, but there are, you know, I think you can't, you have to be creative. And again, it comes down to that passion, right? In, in wanting to work with uh, Indigenous people, learning and watching our Indigenous healthcare providers who many of them have that kind of passion and are so dedicated is, is another key way um, to feel good about the care you're providing. We've all become healthcare providers because we love people. And we need to remind ourselves of that, that we love people and we want them to get well. And so if that was my family uh, member, how would I want them treated, right? It's just, it's a human experience too, thanks. Thanks, Angelina. Yeah, very human experience. The human, um, that's the core to our whole uh, our work, isn't it? Um, there's a question here um, from uh, Vanessa Burrett. Um, I'll just read this out. Sometimes the value we psychosocial clinicians 
that is bring of those trusted and safe relationships are minimized by doctors saying they already do that. Any thoughts on how to manage that? Wow, there's a loaded question. Uh, you know, <laughs> oncologists, they're at the top of the food chain, I like to say, and I respect many of them. Some of them, I, 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 without them, I wouldn't have been able to develop some of the partners and be engaged in some of the work that I'm engaged in. They're really, you know, uh, important key part of the team, but they're a member of the team. That's exactly what they are. Um, I think, you know, the fact that we're in the process in this country of looking to develop national legis legislation that will hold uh, people in the healthcare system who are providing services accountable for their actions is, is, is one part um, of addressing this whole bigger idea. Again, I think, you know, as Indigenous healthcare providers, we often are put in this place that, that it caused us a lot, it's a lot of burden to always be teaching and, yes. and you know, non-Indigenous care providers of that. So my encouragement there is to just, you know, be engaged, uh, watch them, talk to them when you can, understand their role clearly. So, and Indigenous care providers need to also understand their role clearly in all of that, right? I mean, you're going to come across, it's unfortunate that you're going to come across people who are in a position of power who don't, it's like teachers, they're our first line of defense, I think, for children. They don't realize how much impact they have on on people, but it even comes right down from the administrator who's phoning to make an appointment with the cancer patient all the way up through to the oncologist. As a nurse, I can be in a room working with a patient for several days, but when the doctor walks in, my name is Mud, right? So part of it is about being able to advocate really well for that patient, right? Yeah. And you certainly want to do it in a way that's respectful to everybody involved. But there are times when care providers need to be told that was unacceptable. And please learn from what has happened here. Thanks. No, thanks, Angeline. And that... Uh message about everybody, it's everybody's responsibility and role is a, is a key one. It also reminds me of, as you talk, uh, Ness's question talks about uh, uh, how doctors sometimes um, minimise the importance of these issues, is the, the critical role for us in the education of our future doctors. Um, and as, you know, in my role in the medical school, that's a critical issue. You're looking at uh, building greater Indigenous understanding, knowledge and respect in our curriculum for all of our students um, and uh, we graduate a number of Indigenous doctors as well and um, a strong Indigenous health team that helps us do that but it's something that uh, we need to embed from the earliest stages of, a, of uh, the training of our future doctors and nurses and other health professionals. There's not only that, that knowledge but I guess also the sorts of attributes you're describing Angeline of uh, a willingness and a, to, to know and understand uh, the well, human Well we're not going to check I mean, we're not going to change a couple hundred years of colonialism overnight, right? I mean, you know, racism is something that's embedded, like it comes from values, attitudes which come from values. So it takes the generations to change. However, one of my teachers who's passed, uh, who I love very much, you know, once said to me, um, and I've heard other elders say this, if the spirit is strong, life is good. And so that's about your overall well-being. And so for clinicians, I mean, you know, to not understand that or try to understand that is, is not a good thing, right? 
because yes. so much of us being well is about what's up here and what's in here, not about the medication. And that idea of healing as a journey and not just about healing from cancer is very critical to that. I mean, there's many dimensions to us as, as human beings, right? And so um, just looking after our physical well-being it just doesn't always get us what we want. Thanks. Look, that Angeline, that's a very powerful message for us to finish on, I think, um, given the, the time uh, that we're at at this particular point, particularly what we, we across our communities and our health systems can learn from the perspectives of our Indigenous communities as well about the importance of the sense of spirit, well-being, a very holistic approach to health and the importance of community. So uh, uh, they're, they're, it's a very poignant point to finish on. So can I, um, on behalf of everybody, thank you for your presentation and this discussion. And Gail also, um, who um, I think has, she's probably somewhere up near the top of the mountains near Cairns at the moment. So, <laughs> yeah. so I don't know that the reception yeah. that great up there, but I'll hand back to Linda now. Thank you, Linda. Sure. Thanks. Uh, what a great, Thanks. Yes, what a great discussion, Angeline. And I'm sorry we lost Gail. We might even be able to get her um, back for tomorrow's session for a bit of discussion. So I'll try and work that. Um, but really, I feel the weight of the world on your shoulders, Angeline. You're having to, you know, kind of educate everybody, you know, about how to work with these Indigenous communities and call people out. Oh, got my dog here. <sighs> call people <laughs> and they're inappropriate. And so it's been really wonderful to set the stage for our series. Um, we will be meeting again tomorrow with uh, two new speakers, so Rita Henderson and Leah Bill, as well as um, more discussion. And of course, again, on Friday morning with Nadine Karan. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, it's really been a wonderful start to this conversation and so much appreciate your contribution, Angeline and Brian. So thank you. Oh, thanks for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. A real, thank a real you, privilege, thank uh, you. Barry. Thank you, Barry. And uh, you guys just did a wonderful job. Thanks, Brian. Thank well, you. Hopefully Bye -bye. we'll see you all tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Angeline. Thanks, Danielle.